Jesus, we are so thankful for your spirit in this place. Thank you for generously pouring out your anointing on us, in us, and through us, that we might be a blessing to others. Jesus, minister to us through the word that is shared today. I am a vessel to be used by you, my God. Speak through me. Say exactly what you wish to say. I wish to add nothing to. I wish to take nothing away. I wish to speak only your words. And I pray that the words I speak are good seed planted in good soil for each and every hearer that is participating in this word whether they're listening with us right now in real time or they listen with us whenever their present is, that this word would find its way into their heart, into their mind, to lead them on a path that you would have them to go, and that through the seed of this word, fruit would come forward to the edification and the building of your great kingdom. And the only name that brings about salvation, life, and healing Jesus name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Again, family, thank you so much for joining us, for participating in another Sunday session uh, for connecting. We're so grateful for your presence here with us. So we're going to, to jump right in. We're going to continue uh, this journey through um, uh, uh, Paul's letters, Paul's epistles, and uh, we are, uh, this week, we are in Galatians, uh, and we're going to be in chapter four. As I um, indicated, we did review chapter three. We went through chapter three uh, in Bible study this past week. And just by way of a, a very kind of um, high level overview, one of the one of the key elements, one of the key elements um, that that we get from chapter three is if you God bless you, Miss Francis. Ms. Frances Kelly is with us, so good to see you. Uh, one of the key takeaways that we get from uh, chapter three is, um, if you have your Bibles, just briefly uh, turn with me um, to chapter three, verse 15. We're in Galatians, chapter three, verse 15. We're not gonna spend a lot of time here. We're gonna go to chapter four, but I, you know, uh, just again, by, by kind of grounding us, and this is a key point, um, chapter three, verse 15, to give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring who is Christ. And so again, we, we, we want to encourage you to go back. Um, and listen to Bible study, we really break this down. But I, what the key takeaway here is, and we talked about this a bit last week, but we really nail it down. And, and Paul makes it explicitly clear that the way of grace through faith is the preferred way. It's actually the initial and the primary covenant that God made with humanity. God's promise to Abraham was to Abraham and to Abraham's offspring. And many times we go, I go, uh, I'll be very candid and transparent. I generally go, when I think of Abraham's offspring, I go to Isaac. And then I think about Isaac's uh, two sons, Jacob and Esau, and the promise was to Jacob. And then Jacob's 12 sons that become eventually the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. And so Christ is an extension. Christ is is a part of Abraham's lineage because Christ is a Jew and Christ is in fact the son of David. Um, and in fact, we see that mentioned uh, throughout scripture. Matthew and Mark several times um, have uh, onlookers and followers referring to Christ as the son of David. I have never, prior to studying this, prior to digging in and examining this, I had never made the, the direct connection that Christ is the son or the heir of Abraham to whom the promise of the covenant was made. And that's the point that Paul is making here is that the promise uh, uh, to Abraham, the, the covenant promise that, 
Um, you know, I will bless those that bless you. I will curse those who curse you. Your descendants shall be more numerous than the stars of the sky, the sands of the sea, uh, that through your uh, offspring, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Well, of course, particularly we think about it in that context, the idea that the whole world being blessed through Abraham's offspring, it's got to be Christ. And so here we get evidence that God was planning and had always intended a covenant of grace through faith, and that was preferred to the Mosaic law. And so that's going to be further explained here as we go to chapter four. But the other thing that we want to catch here is at the very end of chapter three, Paul makes this other point that is critical. Now, before faith came, this is verse 23 of chapter three. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law in prison till the coming of faith would be revealed. So then the law is our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So the word guardian there um, is, is the same word uh, that's used um, uh, up at the top where, um, and, I, and I, 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 uh, I just, I had it for a second. Um, it's the same word uh, that is the Greek word, pinegagos, pinegagos. And a pinedagos is essentially a slave, a custodian. And so this is a, a, a highly favored slave, but a slave nonetheless. But a slave with a particular authority. And a pinegagos, a guardian, was a slave that had authority over the children of the master. And so the children were not allowed to go to school or really anywhere else without their guardian. They could not exercise their free will as heirs to the promise of being the children of the master until they were of an age. And so while they were children, I hope y'all get this, we got to get this, while they were still children, they were in authority as heirs to the promise, but they were under the authority of a slave, of a slave that was responsible for their well-being until they got to the age of adulthood. And so regardless of the promise that was to come, they were captive by their custodian, by their guardian. The law was the guardian for the children of Israel specifically, but the law became the guardian of the promise. The promise of grace through faith that was to come in Christ Jesus. But we weren't ready for grace. We were not ready for grace. And so the guardian of the law is put in place to lead and guide and secure us until such time as we were ready for the promise of faith, of grace uh, through faith in Christ Jesus. Y'all get that? That is powerful. I know there's not a, a, a jump up out your seat and preach word, but this is a good teach word. This is a word that's going to keep you, that's going to grow your faith and give you the, 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 the confidence and empower you to appreciate what God has done through Christ and, and through the, the sacrifice made by Christ. So, so the law was the guardian that brought us to the promise. But when we reached the age, we were no longer under the authority of the guardian. We're no longer under the authority of the law. The, the authority of the law has now been diminished. Amen. Because we are now of an age where we are heirs to the promise. Let's jump to chapter four. If you with me, give me a good Amen in the chat feed. Chapter four. I mean that the heir, as long as he is as a child, so he's picking up right where we left off, and, and, and that whole idea of the, the, the guardian, the slave. 
as long as he is a child is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, watch this, get this, underline this, highlight this, circle this. In the same way, we also, when we were children, both physically as well as in our mind and in our spirit, and uh, in, in, in our faith, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. So Paul is still referencing that that schoolmaster kind of guardian custodian metaphor that he he left off with in chapter three, and so he continues that point, and then he goes further. Now, so a couple things to keep in mind about that. In both Jewish and Greek cultures, there was a definite coming of age ceremony uh, 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 when a child stopped being a child and, and, and you know, sort of became legally an adult and, and was therefore heir to that promise. And that was a, a defined chronological age. So it was very specific. It was very uh, uh, appointed. In Roman culture, however, there was no specific time. It was when the father determined that the child was ready for adulthood. It, there, there was absolutely a ceremony. Now, there was a defined ceremony. There was a practice, but it was not a, a set chronological age. The father had the authority and the flexibility to vary it based on the child based on the individual children. And so Paul goes from making the point, the very specific kind of cultural point that the law served as our guardian while we were coming of age. But then he goes on in verse three to say in the same way, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. What are the elementary principles of the world? What Paul's referring to here is, is something called the ABC of the universe. That's sort of like kind of universal concept of the way things work. Uh, and, and, and this is, has been in, in place for a very long time um, and is a commonly held principle by lots of different cultures. And in, in some places, uh, it's called karma. Um, and in other places, um, you know, it, it is it is reciprocity. Uh, even scripture, even scripture, um, in Matthew chapter thirteen, the parable of the sower. Um, it, it, even in scripture, Christ um, uses the the elementary principle, the ABC of the universe, to kind of illustrate a point. And that idea is you reap what you sow. You sow apple seed, you'll get an apple tree, you'll, you'll, you'll produce apple fruit. You sow in righteousness, you know, you, you, you reap joy. So there, there is even in scripture this, this idea, but again, it's an elementary principle. It's a basic principle. The issue is many Jews were still holding to this notion, this idea that if you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you get bad. And, and that's all there is to it. And we know that grace is far more complex than simply do this, get that. Grace does not work that way. And so that's why then Paul refers to it as an elementary principle, because we need to grow beyond the concept that this person did wrong to me, and so therefore they deserve retribution. And I did good to this person, and so therefore then good should come to me. And it does not work that way. The rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. And so we need to move beyond Paul is encouraging us and compelling us to move beyond elementary principles, to move beyond this notion of uh, uh, you do, do this, get that, do that, get this. Amen?
Verse four, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. This is, this is a classic. This is a classic one. Born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Daddy, Daddy, Abba, Father. I, I think many of us are familiar with this scripture. The word Abba comes from Aramaic, and while it literally translates Father, the literal translation of the Aramaic word for Abba translates as Father. The term is used almost entirely as, as a term of endearment, as a, as a term of intimacy and familiarity, that, that, it, that it is used exclusively to mean daddy, to, to indicate that there is a familiarity, there is an intimacy, there's a closeness between the child and, and, and the father. And, and we see that used uh, by Jesus. Jesus in Mark 14, 36, Mark 14, 36. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And so here it's a very, I mean, you know, this is in Gethsemane. We, you know, you, you, you all are very familiar with the prayer in Gethsemane where Jesus is just in a very vulnerable state. He's at the, he's at the precipice of being arrested and beginning the march toward Calvary and, and about to endure torture and affliction um, that, that is uh, a severe, incredibly severe. And he begins this march and is in this very frail space where he's pleading with, with his dad. He's pleading with dad. And he says, daddy, please. I mean, you can just hear it. You can just feel our Savior, Daddy, please, Abba, if there's any way, if there's any way to remove this cup, please, Daddy, remove this cup. But it's not what I want. It's what you want. And, and so Abba here Paul is, is, is giving us access to that same level of intimacy. What Paul is saying is through faith in Christ, you have the spirit of Christ in you, which gives you access and permission for that same level of intimacy with God. That through the spirit of Christ, through our faith in Christ, somebody needs to get excited about this. I know I'm not shouting and I know I'm not jumping around. I know I'm not yelling, but I need y'all to be excited about the words and not just the delivery here. And Paul is telling us that through the spirit of Christ, through the Holy Spirit, we have the opportunity. We have the access to have that same kind of intimate relationship that Christ has with the father, whereby we can call God Abba. Father. Can somebody get excited about Abba today? That you can call God your Abba. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Abba, for your spirit. Thank you, Abba, for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. Thank you, Abba, for your presence among us. Abba, Father. Verse 7, so you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. No longer a slave. At the beginning, he says, as a child, there was no difference. There was no difference between a slave and the child, even though the child was heir as a child, there was no separation. 
but Christ came. And so now the law is of no effect. Now we, we move on to, to, to verse eight here. Now Paul is starting to express some real concern. Formally, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, what a blessing. What a blessing. Put it in the chat. Say, I am known by God. Let somebody know in the chat. I am known by God. Uh, 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 bless you, uh, uh, Uncle Obel, uh, a, a good friend of mine, former teacher, Michael Obelamina, uh, Obel is, is in the a building with us. Bless you, sir. Uh, so what a blessing to be known by God. Uh, continue on there in verse nine. How can you turn back again to the weak and the worst, worthless elementary principles of the world? Again, we're back to that ABCs of the universe. Now that you have a more complex understanding, how can you go back? Now that you've graduated high school, how can you go back to the sixth grade? How can you go back? Rather, if we're being literal, how can you go back to the third grade? How can you go back to elementary school? You, you, you're, you're, at a, you're at a middle school, you're on your way to, to high school, you're at a high school, you're on your way to college, and you're trying to return to the basic principles of the world. No, it's more complex than that. So how are you going backwards? Who slaves you want to be once more? You want to be slave to the elementary principle. You want to be slave to the weak and the worthless. Verse 10, you observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. He's talking and referring to the Judaizers here, those uh, Jewish converts that are trying to get the new Galatian believers to accept the Mosaic law. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose. And not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone for I am perplexed about you. And so you can really hear uh, the anguish in these words. Paul is imploring them. We, we, we spent some good time together. I was not in full health, but you hung in there with me. I was not at my best, but you hung in there with me. You were a blessing. You received me well. You, 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 you endured with me. And in fact, if you could, you would have taken my affliction on yourselves to lighten my burden. That's the kind of connection that we had. So how have you walked away so quickly? We bonded. We were together. We were as one. We were moving into this place of grace and faith. How is it that you're so willing to turn to the weak and the worthless? What happened to your blessedness? What happened to your loving kindness? What happened to your faith and determination? What happened? And so now I'm in this place where I have to endure the childbirth of bringing you into the fold of Christ once again, though you've already been born in Christ. How can you turn away? How can you go back? How can you deny what we've had? I wish I were there with you. I wish that I could look into your eyes. I wish I could use a softer tone, but I gotta be strong and I gotta be straightforward and I gotta be direct and I gotta be clear. You've been bewitched and you're going backwards. 
You knew the better way. You received the faith of Christ through grace. And now you want to burden yourselves with the bondage of the law. No, little children, come out of the way of the law. Come out of the way of slavery. Come out of the burden of the elementary principle. Go back into the way of faith by grace through Christ Jesus. Go back to the way that we established together. Come back to me. I'm so perplexed. And so the chapter ends with what we we're calling today our, our topic, our message for today is Galatians colon the allegory of the two sons. And so chapter four ends and we'll get to chapter five. We're going to get to chapter five today and then we'll conclude Galatians in Bible study this week. Um, uh, uh, so uh, chapter four ends and, and takes us to chapter five. And so chapter four ends with this verse 21. Tell me you who desire to be under the law. Do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave, Ishmael, was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Get that, underline that, highlight that. The son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These two women are two covenants. So an allegory, you get it, is a, is, is a way of taking um, an event and having it stand, taking something tangible and having it stand for something uh, conceptual, taking a real thing and having it stand for a, a concept. Uh, so these two women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. Now we're kind of getting into, you know, we, if you want to really get deep with it, now we're kind of getting into the language uh, that's used by John in Revelation, where uh, John describes um, a new Jerusalem descending down from heaven, a new Jerusalem coming down as part of the new heaven and the new earth. And so the new Jerusalem descends upon the new earth. And so here, Paul is given a little bit of a foreshadow, but the Jerusalem that's above is free. Notice how he refers to the present Jerusalem as the Jerusalem of bondage and slavery. The Jerusalem above, y'all get this, is free. And she is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, verse 28, brothers like Isaac, are children of the promise. But just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Cast out the Judaizers among you. Cast out those that would have you go back to the law. Cast out those descendants that are trying to preserve the present Jerusalem and are blocking the new Jerusalem that is to come. Cast away those that want to hold to the past. They want to hold to the old way. They want to hold to the guardian. They want to hold to the schoolmaster. They want to hold to the elementary principles. Cast them out and embrace those that embrace the freedom of the promise that is to come. The new Jerusalem that is born of the spirit. The way that is born of grace through faith in Christ. Separate yourselves from the slaves and the slave mentality. Because those that are born of the world 
are many and those that are born of the spirit are few. And so separate yourselves uh, from those that are born of the world uh, so that your spirit uh, can be edified uh, and Christ can be glorified. And when Christ is glorified, uh, then mankind can be compelled uh, and be drawn to Christ uh, but Christ is not glorified in the law. And so when you conceal yourselves among the bondage and the slaves, then Christ is not glorified and the world cannot receive the light of Christ. The only way for darkness to see the light is for the light to come out from under the darkness. And when we come out from the slavery and the bondage of the law and we stand apart, then the glory of Christ can shine through us and the world that is in bondage can see the light and liberty of freedom in us through Christ and they will come to Christ through us. But as long as we're in bondage, Christ is not glorified. Somebody give the Lord a great big hand praise. Somebody bless the Lord for the freedom that comes through Christ. Let's bring this thing to a close. Chapter five. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ you who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Paul is not condemning circumcision in and of itself. I want to be clear. You choose to, to circumcise your children. You do that. You choose to leave your children uncircumcised. You do that. It's entirely up to you. What Paul is condemning is accepting circumcision as a way to align with the Mosaic law and giving into the pressure of the Judaizers to say, if you're going to be of Christ, who's Jewish, our Messiah, Jewish Messiah, if you're going to, to be of the Jewish Messiah, then you need to submit to the Mosaic law. And men, you need to demonstrate that outwardly through circumcision. The outward demonstration of our faith in Christ is baptism in Jesus' name. Circumcision is not an outward demonstration of our faith in Christ. Circumcision is simply a, 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 a health care and a hygiene choice made by parents on behalf of their children. Circumcision is not a, a, a testimony to our faith and our belief in Christ. And in fact, Paul makes the point, if you submit to the Judaizers and you take on circumcision, then you need to saddle yourself with the yoke of bondage of the entire law, because if you keep one, you got to keep all. Verse seven, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Y'all are familiar with that passage of scripture. Leaven is the same thing for yeast. A little bit of yeast in dough causes the dough to rise. You only need a little bit for the dough to rise. This is why during Passover, the Jews were instructed to remove all the leaven from their home all the yeast from their home so that there was no chance that the dough would rise. So there was no chance that the bread would take longer to bake so that they could move when God said move. And so a little bit, uh, you call yourself, well, let me just get circumcised so I can get these Judaizers off my back. No, bro, that's not how it works. A little leaven leavens the lump. A little yeast causes the whole go to rise. You take on the circumcision trying to compromise, trying to meet somebody halfway. You take on the circumcision. You take on all the law. You try to abide by these elementary principles and you deny grace through faith. You cannot do a little bit. Uh, the old folks used to say it this way. 
You can't be a little bit in the world and a little bit in the Lord. You can't be a little bit out there and a little bit in here, right? You all heard the, the idea, be hot or cold, Jesus said. Lukewarm, you get vomited out. Uh, be all in or be all out. But don't try this back and forth because a little leaven leavens the lump. Can somebody say praise the Lord? Verse number 10, as we come to the end of Galatians chapter five, I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and that the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in what? The whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Paul is saying here, look, I, 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 it is my sincere hope. It's my sincere hope that those that are persecuting you, those that are trying to bring you down, uh, uh, these Judaizers that are trying to saddle you with the yoke of the law, that they get theirs, that, that divine uh, 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 judgment is brought. But that's not your place. Your place is to walk the higher way, which is to exercise love. Only use your freedom to fulfill the law in one word to love your neighbor. Through love, serve one another. Otherwise, you're going to bite and devour each other. If you, if you do not pursue love, you will give in to the base elements of your nature. You will bite and devour. Let's, let's wrap it up. In verse 16, but I say... Walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if I are, but if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works underline that word, highlight that the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit, underline that, highlight that, the fruit of the spirit is what? The fruit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. And those who belong to Christ, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. The works of the flesh are these. The fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. The reason why there's a single fruit of the Spirit, which is love, and then joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, are how love manifests, are how love are acted out, are carried out. What's unique to fruit? What's unique and special to fruit is that in fruit are the seeds of that fruit. You bite into a piece of fruit, and you'll find the seeds of that fruit on the inside so that that fruit can reproduce itself, so that that fruit can make more fruit. And so the fruit of the spirit is love. Love is what brings about the spirit. The, remember what Paul said earlier, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. The fruit of the spirit is love and should compel us to service to one another. The works of the flesh are these things. 
And so if you are in the flesh, you do the works of the flesh. But when you're in the spirit, you produce the fruit of the spirit. It is possible to work in the flesh and to not necessarily uh, 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 copy that, duplicate that, reproduce that. You can work in the flesh and not reproduce that. But when you move in love and when you uh, 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 produce love or when you send out love, love reproduces. It is impossible for love not to reproduce. Now, it may not necessarily be reciprocated. So you may put love out and you may not get love back from where you have put out. You'll get it from other means and you'll certainly get it from the spirit. But when we put love out, love is reproduced. We can put uh, uh, drunkenness out. We can put dissensions and rivalries and divisions. And those things don't necessarily come, come, come back. They certainly may not come back in the same way. But when we do the works of the flesh, we, we work. It is work to do the works of the flesh. The fruit of the spirit is love. And so, and so we, we, we conclude with this. It's certainly not an exhaustive list of, of the, the ways in which love manifests, but the spirit produces fruit. And so it's important we, 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 we move according to the fruit of the spirit. Fruit produces itself. It goes into the ground, it multiplies. And so when you plant love in others, that love is going to multiply. When you pour love into others, that love multiplies. And so let love lead you this week, family. Let love lead you to faith. Let love lead you to grace through faith in Christ Jesus. Let love lead you to grace through faith in Christ Jesus. Let love lead you to grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Family, I want to thank you so much for joining me this week. Thank you so much for tuning in to another Sunday sessions for connecting. I, I pray that this is beneficial, that it is helpful. I pray that you are learning and that you're growing and that you are, uh, you are getting this, that these are seeds that are planted and they're helping you to live a more empowered life through Christ, that they're helping you to live a life of love through Christ. And, and that is my sincere prayer. If you are someone that is new to this, concept, please reach out to us. We'd love to connect and spend some time with you, walk you through uh, uh, not only the scripture, but just talk to you and, and, and help you to receive the love of Christ that is just out in the world. Love, the spirit is out. The spirit, the Holy Spirit is out. It's in the world. It's there. It's ready to receive. All you have to do is receive it. All you have to do is receive it. You receive it through faith, through belief that Jesus Christ is real, that Jesus Christ came to lead us to God, the creator of all things. And if you believe that and you confess that with your mouth in prayer, prayer is just a conversation. It's, it's talking to God. That's all prayer is. It's not complicated. It's not necessarily some set pattern. Although there are some set things that we can pray. pray. Prayer is just talking to God. When you talk, you, there, there is the, the understanding that it's being heard, that it's being received, and that, it's, it, it, that it will be responded to, that the hearer rather will respond. When we talk, we communicate with the understanding and anticipation that the hearer will respond. When you pray, you acknowledge that God exists because there's the expectation that God hears and that God is going to respond. And so when you pray and ask God to send the spirit of his son, Jesus, into your heart, into your mind to live in you, when you accept that Jesus sacrificed his life 
so that the spirit could come and live in you, that is being welcomed into the family of God. That is taking on the gift of salvation provided through Christ Jesus is faith in Christ. And when you do that, you, you are part of the family. You are uh, the heir to Abraham's promise that we preached about earlier today. We would love to walk you through that some more, help you uh, further understand that. Um, please reach out. We're on all the major social media platforms. Please visit our website, myconnectedchurch.com. You can visit our YouTube channel. Search My Connected Church on YouTube.com for all of our content, Bible study, podcasts, uh, midweek recharge, Sunday sessions for connecting. Um, we even have some, some old archives of our connected kids. Uh, Children's Church, we may go back to filming that at some point again. Uh, uh, who knows? Um, we still meet with the children every week uh, for connected kids. So um, lots of content out there for you to, to help you grow and build your relationship with God uh, uh, in you and for you. Um, so please reach out anything that we can do to help. In the meantime, until we meet and convene again, God bless your family. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay in this fight for your faith.